It was the first dwarf planet humanity ever visited. On March 6, 2015, the Dawn spacecraft settled into orbit around the largest object in the asteroid belt. Already the probe had spent over a year circling the belt's second biggest resident, the enormous space rock Vesta. But on that spring day in 2015, it wasn't yet another asteroid Dawn reached, but something far more remarkable. Ceres is the giant of its neighborhood, the only dwarf planet in the inner solar system. So big it makes up a quarter of the asteroid belt's entire mass. Over the next three years, Dawn would get to know it, orbiting this strange world, discovering hydrated salt patches on the surface, digging into its history, uncovering evidence of hidden briny reservoirs. Reservoirs that could, theoretically, support microbial life. When the probe finally went dark in 2018, it died one of the most successful missions of the decade, a mission that has begun to unlock the secrets of our cosmic neighbor. But notice the key word in that sentence there, is begun. Because revelatory as Dawn was, it was only the beginning, a first step towards understanding Ceres' mysteries. And in today's video, we're delving into the case for NASA prioritizing a return trip to our local dwarf planet and asking what a new probe might discover about this most underrated of worlds. It sounds like a trick question. What are the two places in the inner solar system with the greatest concentrations of H2O? Clearly, one of those is the planet that you are on. Earth is an active water world, a place covered with vast oceans and mighty rivers, the pale blue dot of Carl Sagan's famous quote. But what about the second place? It can't be hellish Venus beyond the traces of water vapor in its upper clouds, nor dry and dusty Mars, or sun-blasted Mercury beyond lonely patches of ice. No, the answer to our question lies not in the terrestrial planets, but in a lesser known object, a comparative giant hiding in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. With a diameter of 946 kilometers, Ceres is the only dwarf planet in the inner solar system, a gray, cratered world that comprises over a quarter of the asteroid belt's mass. Nor is its girth the only thing that's impressive. Unlike most of its rocky neighbors, Ceres is rich with water ice, so much so that Dawn Mission Deputy Principal Investigator Dr. Julie castillo Roges has estimated that, to quote, 40% of its volume could be water. So much so that it's our neighborhood's most water-rich object after Earth. You have to go to the moons of Jupiter to find anywhere rocking more H2O. So yeah, Ceres, pretty big deal. Although uh, we should be clear that big here is definitely a relative term. While it's a towering Alphonse within the asteroid belt, Ceres is more of a Edward Elric compared to other planets. The shrimp of the solar system, even tiny old Pluto, is around 14 times more massive. But we don't want to dwell too long on the basic details. Oh, we can save all of that for our inevitable series video. Instead, what we want to focus on today are the reasons why NASA should consider going back for another visit. And in this, fortunately, we're not alone. When the 2022 Decadal Survey dropped, showing what planetary scientists thought should be NASA's priorities for the next 10 years, Ceres' sample return was one of the missions highlighted. Clearly, then, there are good reasons for wanting to follow up Dawn. And none is quite so good as the presence of water. Long before Dawn launched, scientists suspected that Ceres might be rich in water ice. As Space.com notes, that was one of the reasons that it got funded in the first place. Yet even this suspicion couldn't prepare us for what the probe eventually found. Last Casting off in 2007, Dawn took a long, looping route to Ceres, first stopping by the asteroid Vesta in 2011. Prior to arrival at its destination on March 6, 2015, it was assumed the ice on Ceres might be confined to permanently shadowed craters, or possibly around the dwarf planet's North Pole. Quickly, though, it became clear that H2O wasn't just present on Ceres, it was abundant. And what's more, it might not all be frozen. Over the three years Dawn spent in orbit, we received data that confirmed unexpected discoveries of ice volcanoes and oozing impact craters, of briny reservoirs and ancient alien oceans, of a geologically active world that may, to this very day, hold all the ingredients for life. The ocean world. The old maxim goes that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. In other words, it's all very fine for me to sit here in my comfy studio and tell you that Ceres has the ability to support microbial life, but if I can't back it up, then I'm no different from the ancient aliens dude insisting that space lizards built Atlantis. Thankfully, where Ceres is concerned, we have reams of high-quality evidence supporting these conclusions. Evidence that often focuses on Okator Crater. 
A giant in Bergsite, measuring 91 kilometers across Okatar Crater, is one of Ceres' most perplexing sights. A place where Dawn photographed bright white patches before it even entered orbit. These white patches turned out to be salts, specifically hydrated sodium chloride. And that last bit is important because any moisture in salt should boil off into space within a few hundred years of reaching Ceres' surface. The, the salts were still hydrated suggests they formed when briny water oozed onto the crater floor in the recent past. Not that finding traces of bygone liquid at impact sites should have been particularly unexpected. With Ceres full of ice, any meteor would superheat its impact area, turning much of that ice into sloshing rolling water. While the exposed parts would quickly refreeze, residual heat would keep much of that briny water in a liquid state underground. Perhaps for even as much as five million years. The strange part, though, is that Okator Crater is 20 million years old. And even the oldest salt patches on its surface seem to be significantly younger. And that means there's no way that heat from the impact that created Okator Crater lingered long enough to keep water below its surface liquid. No way that it caused those hydrated salts. And that leaves another rather intriguing possibility. Cryovolcanism. Just as volcanoes on Earth produce lava that cools and solidifies and reshapes landscapes, cryovolcanoes produce briny water that oozes to the surface from reservoirs deep underground. But whereas lava can have temperatures well over a thousand degrees Celsius, the briny water from cryovolcanism is extremely cold. So cold, it's close to being a solid. On a frozen object like Ceres, though, that slightly elevated temperature is enough to make it act like lava. It has been suspected that many of Ceres' features, from its mountains and hills to its relatively young surface, are the result of cryovolcanism. Importantly for today's video, though, the existence of this volcanism is only possible if the dwarf planet contains underground chambers of liquid water. Already, we have evidence for at least two of these chambers. Reservoirs of brine just under the surface of Okator Crater that were detected by Dawn. At least, we assume they're reservoirs. As an orbiter, Dawn couldn't land to take samples, and the technology to drill down several kilometers on an alien world simply does not exist yet. Instead, Dawn took fancy, complicated readings to measure the crust density of different parts of Ceres. When researchers found the crust below the crater was significantly less dense than surrounding areas, they concluded hidden pools of water were the most likely cause. Now, assuming that they were right and the density variation wasn't to do with wizards, then the two reservoirs are small, but spectacular. Lying between 19 and 48 kilometers underground, the largest is nearly 420 kilometers from end to end, while the smallest is closer to 200 kilometers. According to Astronomy Magazine, they could each reach depths of 40 kilometers. Not that you'd ever want to go diving in to find out. With temperatures expected to be below freezing point, the only thing keeping these reservoirs liquid is likely excessive amounts of salt. So much so that they're probably less limpid pools and more freezing hell swamps. Still, the idea they're there at all is all sorts of awesome. And they may not be alone. Another place with bright salt deposits on the surface is Halani Crater, which may suggest more liquid exists beneath it. And then there's Cerulea Facula in the Okotar Crater, where water may even still be seeping out onto the surface. If fully confirmed, these reservoirs would make Ceres what NASA likes to call an ocean world. And that's significant, because exploring oceans in our solar system, whether they be long dead like those on Mars or still liquid like on Europa, has been a cornerstone of NASA policy for over a decade. After all, where we find water on Earth, we usually find life. And discovering life in a place like Ceres would be the breakthrough of the century. The Living World. Long, long ago, in that dark and distant age that we call the 1990s, it was broadly assumed that if we want to look for life, we need to look for planets like Earth. That meant a world with surface water, a rocky world that existed not too close to its parent star and not too far away in a region known as the Goldilocks Zone. Since Mars was cold and dry and Venus was an overheated hellscape, that also meant pinning our hopes of finding life on exoplanets, on impossibly distant Earths circling far-off stars that might, just might, be like our own home. Well, what a difference a few decades make. 
Fast forward to today, and NASA no longer thinks that we need to look at exoplanets to locate alien life. No longer thinks uh, we even need to look outside our solar system. Instead, attention has turned to the ocean worlds of our neighborhood. To moons like Europa, Ganymede, Enceladus, Titan, and Triton. To dwarf planets like Pluto and Ceres. For New Horizons lead investigator S. Alan Stern, this expansion of known water-rich places in our own backyard is, to quote, one of the most profound discoveries in planetary science in the space age. A tremendous boost in humanity's search for extraterrestrial life. The only problem? We're still not totally sure what we need to be looking for. Right now, our sample size of living worlds is just one. This one, the planet you live, work, sleep, and eat too many Cheetos on. That makes figuring out the right ingredients for life rather tricky. Since water is a key component on Earth, it's the main thing NASA looks for. Beyond that, we know any life form, no matter how basic, will still need an energy source. But we're relatively in the dark about the specific places life is most likely to evolve. For example, is Ceres a likely candidate because it shares minerals with the plumes that erupt from Enceladus's ocean, or is it a less likely candidate because of its limited energy sources? For Dawn Mission Deputy Principal Investigator Dr. Julie castillo Rogers, the latter seems the most convincing. In 2020, she and her colleagues laid out in a paper why, despite the briny reservoirs possibly being remnants of an ancient ocean, we shouldn't expect to find life on Ceres. The core of her argument was that the dwarf planet has an extremely limited heat budget. Space.com broke down the thinking for the less technically minded among us. The problem arises if briny reservoirs on Ceres are the result of ice melting due to heat released from impacts. As the article quoted Dawn Mission scientist Paul Schenk explaining, the impact generates enough heat to melt the ice and create the groundwaters that can then circulate in a central area. The zone of heat contracts until the water goes away and freezes up over the course of tens of thousands to a few million years. Given it took life some 700 million years to evolve on Earth, there's simply not enough time for even basic microbes to arise in such circumstances. Still, even if that's the case, it wouldn't mean Ceres isn't worthy of future exploration. All the other ocean worlds NASA plans to explore are moons which maintain their subsurface oceans through a process known as tidal heating. Basically, the friction that comes from gravity of their home planet or of other moons tugging on them enough to heat their interiors. Since Ceres isn't tidally heated, it represents a completely different model, one possibly unique in our solar system. Studying it in depth could help us expand our search criteria for future ocean worlds. Not that it's a done deal that Ceres is uninhabited. On their official page of the dwarf planet, NASA holds out the faintest of hopes that life may have evolved there, a hope kept alive by the presence of organic compounds. In 2022, The Independent reported on a new study that confirmed the presence of these compounds in multiple places where Ceres experienced cryovolcanism, in the Ernatet Crater in its northern hemisphere and the Ovara Basin in the south. Now, to be clear, organic compounds does not mean stuff like skin, nails, bits of hair, or alien whiskers. What it does mean are signs of a potentially habitable environment. In this case, in the form of compounds of sodium, carbon, and oxygen. This chimes with a 2018 study that called Ceres a chemical factory. Chemical-rich environments are thought to be another key component to life evolving. Yet, even if it does turn out that there's something living in the lightless waters below Okator Crater, it's unlikely to be anything complicated. Think more simple microorganisms than demon space squid. Regardless, even finding the most basic microorganism would transform astrobiology. At a stroke, we'd have solved a question that has plagued mankind for centuries. The question everyone, no matter how hard-headed and unromantic, at least occasionally wonders when they look at the night sky. Are we alone? Not that hunting for life should be NASA's only reason for a return trip to Ceres, though. An actual mission, if it gets funded, would be so much more detailed and so much more spectacular. The mission. For Ceres fans, the arrival of the 2022 Decadal Survey was a moment for celebration. While the highest priority mission it recommended was an Enceladus orbiter and lander and to plan to probe Uranus, Ceres' sample return was still put forward as a candidate for a lower-cost mission class 
New Frontiers. Capped at $1.1 billion, New Frontiers are NASA's mid-size missions. The class where you'll find some of the coolest, most daring ideas the agency has ever signed off on. It was New Frontiers that gave us the New Horizons probe to Pluto and the Juno mission to Jupiter. Likewise, it's New Frontiers that will soon send the Dragonfly drone to Saturn's moon Titan to soar through its thick orange skies. Now, the hope is that we'll soon be able to add a return trip to Ceres to that rather impressive list. For some, focusing on Ceres may seem a little misguided. After all, there are ocean worlds in our solar system far more likely to harbor life. So why prioritize a place that may be home to a little more than a pair of cold, muddy swamps? And the answer to that is pretty simple. Cost. Visiting Ceres would be far, far cheaper than visiting any other known ocean world. After Ceres, our closest water worlds are the Jovian moons Europa and Ganymede. After that, it's Saturn's moon Enceladus. These are so far away that orbiter or lander missions have to be expensive flagship projects. The upcoming Europa Clipper, for example, will cost over $5 billion. Series sample return can be done for about a fifth of that. The low gravity means sending the samples back into orbit requires less fuel and can be done with pre-existing tech. In this case, the same tech that Japan's JAXA agency is developing for its sample return mission to the Martian moon of Phobos. As a bonus, a series mission would also be faster. Just look at the timetable for a proposed Enceladus probe. Launch in 2038, reach Enceladus for 2050, land to take samples in 2051. Series sample return, by contrast, envisages a 2030 launch, arriving at series in 2037 and returning a sample to Earth for analysis by 2044. That's an extra seven years to celebrate finding freaky space germs if indeed they exist. The plans so far submitted are pretty exciting too. Envisage a full tour of series that would go beyond mere sample collection. The version included in a decadal survey would place an orbiter above the dwarf planet to monitor it for geological activity. At the same time, a lander would take samples from multiple places in Okator Crater, eventually collecting 100 grams of material to take back to Earth. If that doesn't sound like much, just know it's a pretty decent haul from a science perspective. Japan's asteroid sample return mission, Hayabusa 2, only managed to bring back 5.4 grams, and this was more than enough to start work with. Combined with data taken by the orbiter, then, this mission would paint us our clearest picture yet of Ceres, allowing us to confirm and analyze any hidden reservoirs to say whether the dwarf planet remains geologically active, to even hold in our hands a vial of surface material. There's just one problem. To happen, series sample return first needs to be selected for the New Frontiers program. Since the Dragonfly mission to Titan was selected as the program's fourth mission in the summer of 2019, NASA has been repeatedly pushing back the announcement of the fifth round. Originally, it was meant to happen in 2021, then it was pushed back to this fall, but a 2023 debt ceiling agreement in Congress froze NASA's budget for 2024 and increased it only 1% in 2025, a huge shortfall compared to the agency's projected figures. As a result, selecting the fifth New Frontiers mission has been pushed back until 2026 at the earliest and there's no guarantee series sample return will win. Right now, it looks like the proposal will be up against other extremely cool plans, like a Titan orbiter, or a plan to return samples from a comet, or a probe that will land on Venus. It could be that after waiting till 2026, series fans come away with nothing but the faint, bitter taste of disappointment. So this video is basically our pitch for why a series sample return mission should be the mission selected, for why NASA should do everything in its power and budget to return to our local dwarf planet, to hunt for evidence of past or present life, sure, but also do so much more. Because Ceres is not just another object in the asteroid belt, it's one of the most complex, most fascinating worlds in our neighborhood. A place more mysterious than Mars, a destination perhaps more seductive than Venus. A place that may hold the secrets of life itself. If a Ceres mission is selected, it will obviously be a long time before we get any results. Long enough that it seems likely this channel, even if it becomes successful, will have ceased production by then. Nonetheless, it's also soon enough that most of us should still be around to see it, to witness the triumphant return of samples taken from this most underrated of dwarf planets. At that moment, we can only hope that you look back on this long ago video and smile. A smile of remembrance for all of us sat here all the way back in 2023, looking forward to the moment when this sci-fi dream of exploring series finally becomes a reality.